we are here again to celebrate the king of all kings. His name is Jesus. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 1. Welcome home. Welcome those that are joining us online. Matthew chapter 1. Today we're kicking off a new teaching series titled The King and His Kingdom. The King and His Kingdom. Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 through 17 is where we're going to be. As you're turning to Matthew chapter 1, a couple years ago, Audra asked me. Uh, she wanted to trace some of her, her, her ancestral roots. She wanted to trace some of those ancestral roots. I don't know if anyone's ever taken one of those tests. You ever taken one of those tests? You, you, you thought you were one thing and maybe filled with some things, and, and then it was like nothing. <laughs> and, uh, uh, or you were like dead on. I don't know which, where, where, where you fall. But I said, yeah, go for it. She thought, without a doubt, that she uh, was the majority Native American Indian, ran in her blood, not majority, uh, a whole lot, though, a whole lot from, from conversations in our house, I can tell you. And I said, all right, I mean, go for it. So she took one of those tests, and uh, you know what the test yielded? 59% English, 15% Scottish, a whole lot of 1% and under 1%. One of the 1% is Nigerian. Uh, and the other was indigenous Mexico. And, and I'm like, well, I don't see any Native American in this thing. Uh, but there's something intriguing about it, right? There's something intriguing about your family line. When, when, when you start going through your grand your grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents, and then we can't pronounce it even further beyond that. You know, you know what I'm saying? There, there's something special about it. There, there's something intriguing about it. But oftentimes when we open up to a list of names found in the scriptures, what do we do? All right, next chapter. <laughs> now, if you were with us for 2023, we, we looked at the entire book of Genesis, eight different teaching series. It was a, man, it, I, it was a blast. It was a blast. And today marks a study all the way through Matthew. There's going to be different series and things of that nature. But 10 different times in the book of Genesis, we find a list of names. And I can be honest enough to tell you that uh, when we preached those passages of scripture, we did not read every name. We would maybe be here the entire time trying to pronounce all the different names I did, however, refer some of y'all that were, you know, expecting or, you know, wanting one day to have children, maybe start in Genesis with one of those, one of those passages. But what we see before us is a list of names. It's the genealogy of Jesus. Look at verse one, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There's a few different focal points as we look to this passage before us, as we look to this list of names, this genealogy, there's a few different focal points. One is there's a focus on history. We, we see it right there, the account, the account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. There's a focus on history. And Matthew is telling us that this is real history. Genealogies were important in the Old Testament. I believe they're still important T today. It's historical proof Matthew tells us that this isn't a, a fairy tale, that this isn't make, make, make believe, that this is real life. There are 46 names. You can go home later on, count them. Verses 1 through verse 17, 46 different names. There are 42 generations spanning over 1,900 years right here before us. Matthew is giving real accounts that these are real people. These are real kings living over real kingdoms. These are kings who had kids, who had more kids, who, who eventually in God's sovereign redemptive plan gave birth to Jesus the king. And what's before us is this all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's what's before us in this passage. But again, that's the call to our lives. That it's all about Jesus, as intriguing as the past, and those that came before you and I. There is one that we must live for moving ahead, and it is the person of Jesus. There's a focus on history, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The word Jesus or Yeshua, it's a variation of Joshua 
And it means God saves. God saves. This child we just celebrated a couple weeks ago, this child born in that manger died on a real Roman cross. He is coming again in glory one day. And I hope you're ready. I hope, I hope you're ready. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Savior. He was a man. And this genealogy works to make that point. But he's also God. Jesus is the Christ. Now, in case you didn't know, this isn't his last name. Jesus Christ. Not his, not his last name. This, means, this name means anointed one. Jesus Christ, he is the anointed one. Just as David was anointed with oil. It's a custom of that day. To lead the people of God. So is Jesus, the anointed one. He is the Messiah. The long, the long awaited king who would come and usher in his kingdom and bring salvation to all humanity. We see Jesus Christ, the son of David. Now, the son of David is a theme that runs throughout Matthew. This is a title that we'll see over and over again as we study the book of Matthew, the gospel of of Matthew. And, And with this title, the son of David, it's a reminder of Christ's identity, a reminder of Christ's identity that he is the heir to that throne. The one promised so long ago that would reign forever and ever. And it's all about Jesus. It's the theme of this passage from verse one all the way through. Verse 17, David is is emphasized here, and Jesus is the heir to the throne, the fulfillment of God's promise. Look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Write that reference down, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verse verse 6 and 7. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the, the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now look at verse 7. The dominion will be vast, and his prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of who? David. And over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness. From now on and forever, the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. And this prophecy... In this prophecy, we we see that Jesus Christ, the true king, the only king, he will reign, passed on from the throne of David, the son of David. Then then we see this this next title, the son of Abraham. Do you see it in verse 1? The son of Abraham. Now, we we spent an entire teaching series uh, looking at the life of Abraham. Abraham in chapter 12 was called out. From the land of Ur to the land to which the Lord would show him. It would be the land of Canaan, the the promised land. And he was called out at 75 years of age. And what a life of faith Abraham lived. Not a a perfect life. We we looked at his imperfections. We looked at his flaws. but, But what a life well lived. A life of faith. 100 years recorded that that we read from chapter 12 to chapter 25 when he dies at the age of 175 years of age. Chapter 12, the Lord promises to make him into a great nation. Do you remember that? The Lord promises to make Abraham into a a great uh, great nation. Uh, Promises that all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through who? Through, Through him. That was the Lord's promise. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through, through, through him. And his offspring will be given the promised land. And we know that as we continue the biblical historical narrative of Genesis, that this, this promise was passed on from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob to the future descendants. There's a focus on, on history as you look at Matthew chapter 1, and it might be challenging if you have a phone or a digital device to, to, to see this, the full perspective of this, but you can scroll and you'll see it, that, that there's a, 
a section from verse 2 to verse 6. It's the line of Abraham to David. It's 14 generations. Then you'll see before you David to the Babylonian exile, verses 7 through 11. It's 14 generations. Then uh, verses 12 through 16, another 14 generations before us. There's a focus on, on history as we look at this passage. There's also a focus on women. There's a focus on Women, as you look at this passage, people often are, are rush to, to argue today that the Bible represses women. But the reality is that, that the Bible is a document that was way ahead of its time. The fact that normal women are included in this genealogy is significant. You, you see five different women listed throughout this genealogy. Verse 3, you see Tamar. Verse 5, uh, you see Rahab and Ruth. Verse 6, you see Uriah's wife. That is Bathsheba, the woman known as Uriah's wife. Verse 16, you see Mary, the mother uh, of Jesus. And we might think, you might be thinking today, well, well, of course, women should be, would be listed. But, but this was progressive for back then. Jesus' kingdom shook the status quo. We're going to see that as we, as we study through the book of, of Matthew. And it, it gave a, gives a picture of what the, the king's ministry would look like. Matthew and Jesus communicate clearly. Listen closely. Women are worthy to be a key part of the kingdom. And the list of ancestors of the king proves this, this point. We, women uh, were part of Jesus' group of followers. That They were among the first witnesses of the resurrection. Do you, do you recall that? They were some of Jesus' best laborers. There's a focus on women. There's a focus on history. There's, there's a focus on outsiders. And for this, all of us can say thank you to God. That there's a focus before us in this passage on, on outsiders. That you and I at one point were apart from, from Christ. In need of salvation. That's what we just celebrated together. What a beautiful thing to say, thank you, Jesus, for your blood. There's a focus on outsiders. Outsiders are, are welcome. And there was an anti-outsider sentiment in old school Israel. And that's a fact. Four out of five women listed in this genealogy of Jesus the king are outsiders. They're, 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 they're Gentiles. Non-Jews, Rahab, Rahab is a Canaanite who helps Israel defeat Jericho. Ruth is a Moabite who follows her mother-in-law, Naomi. Bathsheba is an outsider. She's a Gentile having married uh, Uriah the, the Hittite. There's also this Jewish tradition that Tamar was a Syrian who also came to worship the one true God. Rebecca McLaughlin says, there is this thought that Christianity is Western. And works against diversity. Contrary to popular conceptions. The Christian movement was multicultural. And multi-ethnic from the outset. From the very beginning. Multicultural. Multi-ethnic. From the very, very beginning. That Matthew begins. With how the good news of Jesus is meant for all. And Matthew closes in chapter 28 verse 19. He closes with the great commission. For those who follow Christ to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Revelation chapter 7. It says, after this I looked. And there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Can you just imagine this with me? Just imagine this as I read this. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Verse 10, listen for this. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. What a day it will be. 
it, 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 it's hard to, to fully wrap our minds and, and, and hearts around what a day this will be in heaven when people from all nations, all tribes, will be gathered around the throne. And there's only one on that throne, and it's not you, and it's not me. It is the Lord our God seated on that throne. Can you just imagine for a moment what that day will be like? And we all shout with one voice and one accord, salvation belongs to the Lord. Christianity is the most diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural movement in all of history. If God is about incorporating all nations into his saving plan and even the making of the Messiah, ask yourself, am I with him? Are we with him? Are we on, on his team? There's a focus on outsiders. Next, we see there's a, there's a focus on sinners. It's not a word that we like to talk about, but it's a word that's needed. It's a, it's a word that I need reminding of, of what I was saved from. Amen. If not, I, I, I can quickly, I so quickly turn inwardly focused where it's all about me. It's all about me. I don't want to do for anyone. I don't want to hear from anyone. I don't want to serve anybody. It's all, about, it's all about me. There's a focus on, on sinners. And as we look through this gospel of Matthew, what we'll see is that Jesus spent a whole lot of time with them. <laughs> In fact, the religious leaders of the day shunned, they, they ignored, they, they walked around, they, they, they ran from those that were messy, those that were in sin. And, and what do we see time and time again? Jesus is running towards the mess. I, I don't know about you, but I praise God that he ran towards the mess of Tim O'Carroll. Can you just thank him for running towards the mess and filling the blank with your name? There's a focus on, there's a focus on sinners. Tamar, if you recall in Genesis chapter 28, disguised herself as a prostitute and she slept with her father-in-law, Jacob. Do you remember that? She's listed in here. Verse three, Rahab, though she helps out the armies of Israel, we're good with that. She's a prostitute by trade. Bathsheba, Uriah's wife sleeps with David the king as he sends her husband to the front line of the battle. Of course, these women here have, have sinful pasts. And so do the men. Ugly, sinful pasts. You and I can read the Gospels and see people that Jesus redeems. See people that Jesus rescues. We can also see them here, even in, in the king's line. And here's the encouragement. You, you may have a past, but you can also have a future. Consider that. All too many times, the enemy wants you to focus on your past because he knows, oh, he knows the glorious future that's available in Christ Jesus. He knows it. We all have a past, every, every person, starting with me. Be encouraged today that there can be a glorious future in Christ Jesus. If you know these stories, maybe you need to spend some time just going back over them. You, you may say Tamar ended up in the place due to abuse from men or, 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 or like almost all who sell their bodies. Rahab was doubtfully there completely by choice, Bathsheba. What happened to her was almost certainly not her decision. There's a power play here. It's King David. I mean, he's the king. And so here's the truth. We're not just sinners, but we're sufferers. That's all of us. We've, we've sinned against others, and we've been sinned against. That's all of us. We've sinned against others. You've sinned against others. And you've been sinned against. We're, we're both sinners and sufferers. And we have the hope that Christ redeems our past, listen, as well as our pain. I want you to hear that today. We have hope. As we look at this passage before us, 
that Christ redeems our past and he redeems our, our pain. There's a focus on sinners. As we read through this text, there's some good kings, but, but there's a whole lot of bad ones. <laughs> there's a whole lot of, lot of bad ones. I, I, mean, I mean, again, it's, it's King David. At one point, he's known as the, the man after God's own heart. Do you, do you recall that? That's what David is known as, the man after God's own heart. And then now in another instance, he's the one that, that should be out to battle, leading his army, leading his men. And he stays back and he's out one day chilling on the top of the palace. And he looks over and what does he see? A naked Bathsheba. And what does he do? He, he, he makes his way over. And, 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 and not only, not only does he sleep with Bathsheba, he, he sins as I said already, he sends her husband to the front line, ending his life. Jesus is for people like us. While he is sinless, and hear me very clearly today. Jesus Christ, sinless, he came from a line of sinners, people like you and me. And do we see that in ourselves? And do we bow humbly before him? Do we bring Jesus our problems and our, our pain? Do we open up our arms and welcome sinners and sufferers into our lives and into his life? I pray, church, that we would be proactive in welcoming people into the arms of Christ, the only one that can forgive, the only one that can heal, Jesus Christ. The names in, in, in this list before us, chapter one, this list of Jesus' ancestors, they make a point. Our Lord is about restoring all that he's made, all that he's made. He wants to restore it about bringing salvation to all his fallen creation. And in his sovereign plan, it, it involved sending his son, the Savior, into the world to die for sin and be raised to life. And in this genealogy, we see God sovereignly working over all these years to see all things summed up in Christ. God's people are in their land, but they're living under, under Roman occupation. Roman, the Roman Empire at this time, they were ruling the world. Life was extremely difficult as Matthew accounts these names and follows Christ. Life is difficult. Hopes are to come by. And leading up to this point, the Lord has been silent for 400 years. The thick darkness hangs over that land. And then the star shines over Bethlehem. That holy night. Christ descended to earth. He came to dwell among us. And with him comes hope. And this list of names reminds us that God's plan did come about. His sovereignty has been seen even through evil people, and not just evil people, but even normal people. And not even all the kings are listed here. Most of the citizens of those nations aren't. They weren't supposed to be. Matthew is making a point that millions lived and died. And they lived normal lives. They live fallen lives. And here's the beauty of it all. God was quietly, faithfully working in his way, in his timing. And he would not abandon his creation. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4. Would you write that reference down? Galatians 4 4 says, when the time came to completion, God sent his son born of a woman born under the law. Verse 5, to redeem those under the law so that 
we might receive adoption as sons. Consider, consider this passage. When the time came to completion, God's perfect timing, God's sovereign timing, what did he do? He sent his one and only son, Jesus, born of a virgin. Her name was Mary, born under the law, knowing that there's no way that you and I could amount, could, 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 could keep the law. We needed a savior to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. We might be adopted into this family of faith. And as, as we took those elements together, that's really what we're saying. Thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed. And thank you that there's a community of faith, a biblical community of faith that I can do this life with and, and, and make you known and live for your glory. So God rules over his world. God keeps his promises. God is in control. And as I say time and time again, he is good. And, and here, here, here's also the, the beauty. He's not just good and not just in control, but he's always with us. He's ever present. There's not one moment of your life that he's not there. He is all present. In this genealogy, we are reminded of this before Christ's birth, as well as his death. But no matter how things may seem, hear me clearly today, no matter how life looks, God's plan is still being worked out. Back then, his plan to get them to the first advent that, that, that we're arrived. Jesus' birth. You know right now, right now to get us to the second advent where he comes back in all his glory. Verse 16. And Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called Christ. Verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David until the exile to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the exile to Babylon until the, until the Christ, 14, 14 generations. You might say people are left out of this genealogy. As we've already discussed, you're, you're absolutely right. There's, there's only 46 names. There's some 42 generations. But, but this, was a, was, this was common in, uh, at this time. It was to help with memorization. It was to help with style. It was, to, it was to help make a point. See, the repetition of the word 14, you see that before you in verse 17, it is, is significant. Hebrew characters had numeric values. Don't miss this. Hebrew characters had numeric values given to them. The word David has just three letters. The word David has just three letters. The Hebrew letter D is worth four. The letter V counts for six. D plus V plus D equals 14. And it seems like Matthew. As this is before us, it seems like Matthew here as a Jew himself writing to Jewish believers is just shouting this is David. This is the son of David. He, he is king. And he's the one that you've been waiting for. So there's a focus. There's a focus on history. There's a focus on women. There's a focus on outsiders. There's a focus on sinners. And, but, but, but don't miss this, church. The focus. The focus. This passage. The focus is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Patrick Schreiner, a scholar, says how the 16 words in verse 1 summarize the entire story of the Bible so far. I love it. First 16 words, verse 1, summarize the entire Bible. Jesus is the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. And, and he points out, he says, the book 
of genealogy, the words of the book of genealogy could also just as easily be translated the book of Genesis. Those same words are used in the Greek version of the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, where God describes the beginning of heaven and earth and the creation of his people. In verse 1, listen, verse 1 reminds us also of the beginning. Adam, Abraham, David. It encompasses all history, but it also expresses the point that it's all about Jesus See, see, this genealogy isn't primarily about people. The point of history, the focus of all time is Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 39, and then the New Living. Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Matthew's genealogy has a past, a present, a future. And Jesus Christ, we're now brought into this family. Abraham, David become our fathers. It becomes our genealogy, becomes our family tree. And though this world seeks historical rooting and, and future life in, in, in various ways, there's only one child, is, only one child establishes the new creation. Jesus is the point of this genealogy, for Jesus is the point of the Bible. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, the, the law then was our guardian until Christ. Do you, do, you see, do you see that? The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith uh, until Christ. The standard was, was the law. But now Christ Jesus has appeared. I mean, that's what we're celebrating. And I hope it's not just like a week of festivities or, or for some of y'all, it's a, a month or a couple months of festivities, you know, Christmas. But, but, but I hope that's the celebration of our lives that Jesus has come. And with Jesus, again, there's, there's hope. There's a focus on history. There's a focus on women. There's a focus on outsiders. There's a focus on sinners. Again, the focus is Jesus. And I want to challenge us today, this new year, to live for the king. There's only one king sitting on one throne. And it's not you, it's not me. It's his rightful throne. And he's calling for all of us, all of you, all of me, to submit and surrender to his lordship because he is the only king worthy. I will live for King Jesus. As we close, we, we look at these names. In this passage before us, it isn't about Abraham. It isn't about David. It's really not about these women. It's, it's really not about these men. It's really not about these kings. Again, it's about one man and one king. And his name is Jesus and when my life is over and your life is over and our names are written down, this, you, your specific genealogy, I, I, I wonder if God wills hundreds of years from now, what, what will be noted about your life and my life? Will you live for the king? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Will you live for the king? All across this place, and online, will you live for the king? I want to challenge you to, would you just, right where you're at, just consider your response from all of this. I, I know there's a, there's a lot of words today. There's a lot to consider, but Just say, Lord, what is my response? What do you want me to do with this? Would you just say it? Just cry out to the Lord. What do you want me to do with this? As people are praying all across this place. I wonder if the, there might be someone here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus, and today would be the day of salvation for you. There's people praying in the house and online. There's people praying, God, what do you want me to do with this? Help me to live for your glory. Perhaps there's someone here, 
under the sound of my voice has never surrendered over to Jesus for salvation. And today that might be the day of salvation for you. The gift of God is available. The gift of salvation, which is eternal life, is available. The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord. You will be saved. And I wonder if that's your prayer today. I wonder if that's your prayer today. As people are praying all across this place, perhaps there's one that's never surrendered. You want to reach out today and accept the greatest gift that is found in Christ Jesus, which is salvation from sins, hope of heaven, a living hope for tomorrow. That's your prayer. Would you just say something like, like this from your heart to God's? Jesus, dear Jesus, I am a sinner. You are the Savior. I trust you to forgive me of all my sins. I call upon your name to forgive me of all my past, present, future. I trust in you completely. I believe you came to this earth. You died and you rose again. You're alive today, I believe. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. In just a moment, there's going to be men and women at different corners of this room. And I would love to pray with you. If you're online, there's a host that would love to pray with you. Perhaps you made a decision just now to reach out and accept salvation, a gift. And today would, is that day for you that changes everything. Would you step out of your seat in just a moment when, when, when we start singing a song? Would you step out of your seat and go to some of these people and let them know I made a decision for Jesus today? Maybe you want to recommit to follow Jesus. Maybe you got a little off, off the path and God's calling you home or, and you want to just recommit. And, and would you allow a brother or sister to pray for you? Maybe you're going through something. There's that pain that we talked about and problems that you're facing and, and you just want somebody to pray for you. You don't have to tell them everything. God knows it all. But there's something special. A brother and sister prays with you, stands with you. Would you stand to your feet today? Would you move as the Spirit of God leads you to move? What is your response? What will your response be?